I, my the experience directly that the the love that our teacher this evening, Valerie Mason John, her Buddhist name Vimala Sara, is uh, embodies that love fully. I had the great pleasure of meeting Vimala Sara in 2019 at the uh, one of the largest gatherings of Black Buddhist teachers, and. Uh, at the close, some teachers were, everyone was invited to uh, offer a video recording, and I raised my young teacher hand and went in and recorded a terrible piece of something, which Vimala Sara and some of the other editors were, you know, monitoring from the other room, and I came out, and she said, it was just great sincerity and love, like, you won't have to do that ever again. She didn't tell me it was great because we knew it wasn't great. <laughs> she didn't say it was horrible, but just sending just, just what I needed in that moment. Hmm. Welcome, Vimala Sara. Uh, she's from the UK and hails now from uh, British Columbia. Uh, she has a remarkable background and one that I imagine often leads people to remark about her resilience or stand in amazement about just how far she's come since her days in the orphanage or on the streets or embroiled in addiction or other self-destructive behaviors. And indeed, she's traveled quite some way. Her CV includes uh, that she trains in conflict transformation She's authored and edited eight books, uh, one the forthcoming in July, uh, entitled African Wisdom, Black Liberation, Buddhism, and Beyond. She's the co-creator of Mindfulness-Based Addiction Recovery, the co-founder and author of Eight Step Recovery, uh, using the Buddhist teachings to overcome addiction. And she's ordained into the Triratna B Buddhist community, which uh, is an international fellowship of Buddhists who are dedicated to communicating Buddhist truths in ways appropriate to the modern world. And I can think of no better person at this time to hold space and lead us in conversation, courageous and compassionate around race. So glad to have you here with us, Vimala Sara. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, um, Stacy. Um, it's uh, just an honor to uh, be with your Sangha and to just be with you in this, this, this context. Uh, you know, one of the great things about the pandemic is that we have been able to come together virtually. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. And, um, and just really wanting to take a, a moment to just, just kind of be aware that many of you uh, are from the Minneapolis area. Um, so definitely in the hot seat of tension, of uh, distress, of dialogue, communication, yeah, so just wanting to take a moment to acknowledge that. Yeah. And I just thought I'd let you know I've typed it in 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 here. Um, this is my uh, nine books. My most recent book has been shortlisted for two major uh, awards in Canada. I'm still your Negro, a homage to James Baldwin, which speaks directly to um, what's been happening in the world. So I thought I wanted to start, uh, we, we will do some meditation. We have 90 minutes together, I believe. That's correct, yeah, 90 minutes. So I wanted uh, to, let me just share my screen. Um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat, okay, and if you click onto that chat, uh, click onto that link and it will take you through to 
Let me just share my screen. It will take you through to this. Okay, so if you could answer the question, what would you like to take away from this compassionate conversation about race? What would you like to take away? And it's anonymous, so nobody has any idea who plugged in what, yeah? So um, feel free to write whatever you want to write. So yeah. Hmm. Yeah, if you, anybody else wants to um, share, we've got connection, understanding, laughter, strength, activity, new and better skills, fortitude, uplift imagination, allow collective grief, fierceness, openness, truth, barriers broken down, more understanding, wisdom, humility, skill, home, openness, awakening, acceptance, tears, belonging, engagement, strength, ease, acceptance, deeper understanding, clarity, resilient, hope, fortitude, humility, courage, hope, inspiration, insight, truth. Yeah. Thank you. Practice, healing, yeah. engagement. Thank you. Connection, compassion. Yeah. How to's. Thank you all for sharing. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, I just um, thinking of the words of just insight, awakening, hope that it really is possible to, um, it, it really is possible to wake up, to have freedom, freedom from your dukkha, yeah, dukkha. And I know that we, um, the traditional way of describing dukkha is suffering. Yeah, but I, I just, um, I was having a conversation with Ken McLeod recently and he spoke about dukkha being struggle. And I just thought, yes, when we struggle with reality, that's what keeps, that's, that's the suffering that we are struggling with reality. Struggling, you know, what is that? What is one's reality living in a white body? What is one's reality living in a black, brown body? or in a form of the body, the color that I didn't even mention. Yeah. What is the struggle living in this body, in a gendered body, in a racialized body, or in a non-racialized body? Yeah. Yeah. And so that awakening really comes with being in relationship with ourselves. Uh, Dogen, a uh, 12th century Buddhist teacher, once wrote that to study the Buddha way is to study the self. 
And so if we're going to study the self, we have to become aware of what has made up this self. Yeah. What is this self? What, what has society projected onto the self? How do we come into relationship with that self? Often we hear in the rooms, in the Dharma halls, in the rooms of Buddhism, this non-self, non-self teaching. Well, before you can even think about non-self teaching, one needs to come into relationship with the self. One needs to have a harmonious relationship with the self. One, which is if we look at the Brahma Viharas, the first stage of any of those sublime abodes, the first stage of, of loving kindness, of compassion, of sympathetic joy, of equanimity, the first stage is beginning with the self. Yeah, one cannot escape the self. One has to come into relationship with the self. Yeah. One has to come into relationship with the guilt, the guilt that that people carry, the guilt of wanting to repair, you know, make reparations, the guilt, the guilt that we can carry, coming into relationship with the shame that we can carry, thinking that we have done something wrong, people wronged us, and we make it think that we have done wrong. So to study the Buddha way is to study the self. And let me remind you of this is one of the favorite things I love to talk about is the prince's awakening. You know, not enough is pointed to the prince's awakening. If we think before the prince became woke, what was going on in the prince's mind? The prince came face to face with his struggle with samsara, came face to face with suffering. You know, the prince was assailed with every mental state one could imagine. And intergenerationally, it said the prince came face to face with past lives. So before we can wake up and have this awakening, we have to come into relationship with our mental states, with the Calm of the parker of far past lives, of the fruits of our past lives, of the fruits of our intergenerational trauma. Yes, we do have intergenerational gifts. Yeah. And we can bypass many, many, many people who step into the rooms of Buddhism are very good at spiritually bypassing. Yeah. It's like, why do we have to talk about politics? Why do we have to talk about race? That's got nothing to do with the Dharma. Well, the Buddha was born in India, which if you're familiar with India, has a very strong caste system, so strong it still survives today. And the Buddha made it very clear that it wasn't your birth that counted, it was your worth because the Buddha didn't sidestep politics or race, knew that this was a really important thing. And that actually there were people who were thinking because of the, the class that they had been born into, because of the caste system that they'd been born into, that they were more superior and they had more access to awakening. So much so I, I won't even go into the caste system because I'll, I'll sidetrack from what I'm talking about. Although I will mention Dr. Mbeka, who did the mass conversion, the largest ever mass conversion to Buddhism in one day in 1956 on October the 14th. He converted from Hinduism to Buddhism and he converted to, to Buddhism because he realized that all caste was, was a state of mind and therefore you needed a religion to emancipate the mind. And guess what? He died six, six weeks later, December the 12th, he died. Maybe it's December the 14th, he died. And the Buddhist world did not come to his people's aid, and why? Because they said it was a political conversion. How can you separate the political from the personal or the person from the political? It's impossible. Yes, they did not come to his people's help, didn't. So you had 
hundreds and thousands of people in India floundering. All they knew was the, the five uh, lay precepts plus the 26 more precepts that, that um, Ambedkar gave to his people, things like throw out Hinduism. So if Ambedkar was now, he would say, throw out racism, throw out, had to talk to that, had to talk to, to what was oppressing the, what was then called the untouchable people. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes we hear in the Dharma halls that Buddhism isn't therapy. Excuse me? If people need to use the Dharma as therapy, then it's their therapy. Yes, we can take it further. It can be something more than therapy. But for many people, as we know, it's something therapeutic and they use it because of the, the racial trauma or the sexual trauma or the, the physical trauma, the mental, emotional trauma, because the Dharma has the capacity to emancipate the mind. In the words of Bob Marley, free yourself from mental slavery. Yeah. And no one but ourselves can free ourselves. Yeah. That's what Bob Marley was talking about. So coming back to Dogen's quote, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. We've got a lot to do. Yeah. We have to stop spiritually bypassing. And how do we do that? if we're fortunate to be in blissful meditative states. Yeah, some of you here, you know how to get into those blissful med meditative states. That's wonderful, it's great, great, yeah. You know, and we need, we need to have blissful states to encourage us to keep on going and nothing much happens. If we think of the Tibetan wheel of life and we think of that God realm, we know in that God realm, the blissful state that at some point, the good luck, the good luck runs out and we drop back out, drop back down into that air realm. Yeah. It's like, it's, 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 it's not permanent and it's because we haven't done that work. Yeah. And of course, many people want to slip into that state because it's a protector. It protects us from all the crap that's happening out in the world. Let's get into dhyanas and then I don't have to think about what's happening in the world. And of course, if that happens. We become alienated. We become separate from the world. And the reality is with these Dharma teachings, there is no other. There is no other. OK, so rather than thinking there is no self, let's think of there is no other. And we know that actually part of the disease of of systemic racism, it's this othering, it's this separate and other, yeah, part of that disease, yeah. So to study the Buddha way is to study the self, and to study the self is to let go of the self. So for those of you who are here in the white body, listening to this conversation, one has to learn what it is, what is it that you are walking with around the world? What is the unconscious bias that you are walking with in the world? What is it? Because you will have it. You, you know, what is the racism that you walk in this world with? What is it? Because I walk with internalized racism. So if I walk with internalized racism, how can you escape not walking with racism? And I walk with internalized racism because of all the messages that society says about black and brown bodies. Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's in the ventilation system, this racism. We can't, it's a gas, it's like a poisonous gas. We can't avoid it. We breathe it in daily. And we're not even aware that some of us benefit because of the body that we're born in. We benefit from some of these things and we have to become aware it's only when we become aware that when we've really studied the self we know we can begin to know what it is that we have to let go of yeah and it's a lot to let go of you know let's forget about privilege and saying letting go of privilege it's like you know, I have, I've got some of my white friends who are doing the work and they talk about, oh my God, it's so hard. And, 
and people are going to do this and we're going to get ostracized. And I just say, get over it because it's been hard for us for years. Get over it. This is the journey. You will get over it. We've survived, you know, because it is as soon as you, you know, I've got friends who, white friends who run Dharma halls and they, they tell me as soon as they start talking about race and social justice, people leave. People, 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 people leave. Yeah. They go somewhere else because they don't want to know about it. Some, some people who run these centers don't want to mention it because the people who will leave will be the ones, the big donors, and they want to keep their donors. Yeah. They want to keep the money. They want to keep the center open. And so they choose not to mention it. Yeah. So to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to let go of the self. Yeah. And to let go of the self is to be illuminated by a myriad of things. And it's only when we go through that process do we know what we will be illuminated with. And I say what we're illuminated with is the wisdom and compassion. And just knowing that, for me, awakening is bittersweet. When we, when we begin to wake up, I know when I begin to wake up to reality, it's like, oh, no, I really don't want to see that. I want to turn my head the other way. And yet I know, I know, I know in that bitterness, there is this sweetness. There's this saying, it's better to have never have woken up than to have woken up and then pretend to be asleep. And they're the most difficult, the most difficult white people I have to deal with are the ones who have woken up to something and then pretend to be asleep. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So this, this conversation, and I want to say that this, for you, this, this compassionate conversation about race may just happen in this silo. For me, it happens every day of my life, this conversation about race. It happens every day of my life. I was raised by white people, so it happened every day of my life. You know, I, I would, as I was, as kids, the, the aunties and uncles, they would take us out of the village and you would get these white people coming up to our white carers, spitting in their face, hitting them. How dare you have these black children? Yeah. So this, this conversation about race for me has been every day of my life. Yeah. I can remember being in school, being in school and it's like a teacher telling us that we're going to end up scrubbing the floors and that we're inferior and some of the black kids we just start throwing the books around and whatever you know and what and I can remember thinking why do I have to think about race why do I have to think about race as a child yeah so this conversation for those of us in black and brown bodies is is every day still today I'm in relationship I have I'm married to a white partner yeah so still that conversation happens you know my my partners in this uh white awareness group and they're reading resma menicum and and you know she's telling me you know all this stuff in resma menicum and their their group was on a monday and she's telling me about it and i said well didn't you talk about the duante the duante right killing didn't you talk about that that's real get your head out of the book and get real talk about that talk about the unconscious bias tell me how is it how is it that this white police woman can say it was an accident when you know this is happening in the same state where this trial is happening of course people are going to be impacted they're they're human beings white police some white police are going to be on the side of Chauvin and thinking how dare is this going to happen to us? Are our rights going to be taken away? And others are going to be on the other side. And, and fear, this whole fear, wasn't an accident. Yeah. The fact, the fact that she even had to take something out, the fear, the threat. Yeah. And this is, this is what we're all walking into the Dharma halls with. In fact, actually, since we've gone virtual it means that when i leave the dharma hall i don't have to worry about being stopped by the police yeah 
That's what it means being virtual. Yeah, we come in, we come into the And let me tell you, even in my own, even in my own community, those days of going into the Dharma Hall and you'd see the same white people on the street and you'd say hello and they'd go like that because you became a threat on the streets. So this, this, is, this, this is a conversation. How do we begin to have that conversation? Yeah. I, I quote Pat Parker here because in a way, Pat Parker is saying something very similar to Dogen, the late, the African-American writer, lesbian writer, Pat Parker, who said it was a letter to her white friend and she says, first you remember I'm black and second you forget I'm black. Yeah. First I remember you're white and second I forget you're white. Yeah. And how can we get to that place? How can we get to that place? We've got a long way to go. And so one of the ways we can get to this place is learning to like and love ourselves. Yeah. Each of us learning to like and love ourselves and to accept ourselves. Guilt, you've got to ask it to relax. You're not going to get anywhere. Guilt, guilt, that's not going to help anybody. It's not going to help you and it's not going to help anybody. Okay. Guilt is a protector. It's protecting you from facing reality. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the things one has to do is to, is to let the guilt step aside. So we're going to do a practice. It's, we're going to focus on the first stage of loving kindness. And I'm going to do it with the, the first stage of loving kindness with the five precepts, okay? Because as lay people, um, I say I'm, I'm ordained, but as I say, talking to you, some of you may be ordained in this room, but as lay people, one aspires to live by the, the five precepts, the precepts to help train the mind. Yeah. And in fact, if we can really live by these precepts, there can be a flowering of something new, a flowering of something different. And in this practice, we're going to focus on the positive iteration of these precepts. They're couplets. In fact, um, the traditional way is in the, I don't like to talk of them in the, in the negative form, but you know, that the, the traditional, in the traditional form, it's all, all what we're undertaking to abstain from. And as Westerners, because apparently, Westerners found it so difficult to, to be with around having to sit with what we're undertaking to abstain from. It's really interesting. So it's not as I say it and I see Stacy smiling because it's like it's just so interesting that Westerners found it so difficult to have to live with what they have to abstain from. And I think if we if we look into the present day, Westerners find it really difficult to have to abstain from racism. I mean, that could be that could be a training principle and a precept. You know, it's like, you know, and so we had to bring in these uh, positive iterations, and they're very beautiful. What what we bring into fruition, and as we are going to be focusing on that first stage of of loving kindness, unlimited friendliness. So, if loving kindness is a is Act, is, is activating. Just know that this practice of metta, Maitri Bhavna, is about friendliness. How can we cultivate friendliness, warmth, and loving kindness towards ourselves? So if you get yourself comfortable and really see if you can just allow what I've said to just begin to just settle, yeah? And of course, thoughts may arise. So I'm not gonna say anything for a couple of minutes. So just allowing yourself to, to settle and arrive um, onto your meditation spot.
So if your head is full of thoughts, just ask them to relax and step aside so that you can really allow yourself to connect, to connect to your essence. Yeah. I'm going to begin with chanting the Vajrasattva Mantra. I'll do it three times. And in this mantra, there's a, there's a bit where it's, we're asking Vajrasattva, who's, a, you know, in, in Buddha form, one of the uh, forms of the Buddha, Vajrasattva, uh, non-dual. Vajrasattva is non-dual. And um, we kind of asking Vajrasattva to be firm for us and Vajrasattva cuts away that, that, that greed, hatred and delusion. And there's a part in it where there is this, this laughter and it's this laughter because we thought we were impure, but we were never impure. We've always been pure. Yeah. And that's the laughter of realizing that we've always been pure. We, 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 we were born pure. What actually happens is, is through our conditioning, the heart gets covered up through the conditioning, through society conditioning, through family conditioning, through intergenerational conditioning. We become these beings walking around with, with either internalized racism or that externalized racism. But actually, we are all pure. So Vajrasattva really allows us to come back to our pure essence. And at the end, you'll hear an ahum pat. And that's away with evil, away with this greed, hatred, and delusion. Om Vajrasattva Samaya. Manu Palaya, Vadra Sapo Veno Petishta, Thread Home Baza, Sutosho Me Baba, Suposho Me Baba, Anaracto Me Baba, Sava Sidim Me Precha, Sava Kama Sucha Me, Shitam Shreya Kuru Hung, Ha 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 Ho, Bagaba Sota Bakata, Vadra Me Muncha, Vadri Baba. Mama Hatsa Miyatsapa Ah Hum Pat Hum Vadra Sapa Samaya Manu Palaya Vadra Sapo Veno Petishta Thread Home Baba Sutosho Me Baba Suposho Me Baba Anaracto Me Baba Sava Sidim Me Precha Sava Kama Sucha Me Shitam Shreya Kuru Hum Ha 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 Ho Bhagavaso Tabakata, Vadra Me Mancha, Vadri Bhava, Mamahatsa Miyatsapa, Ah Hum Pat, Hum Vadra Sapa Samaya, Manu Palaya, Vadra Sapo Veno Petishta, Dread Home Bhava, Sutosho Me Bhava, Suposho Me Bhava, Anaracto Me Bhava, Sava Siddhi Me Precha, Sava Kama Sucha Me, Shitam Shreya Kuru Hung, Ha 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 Ho, Bhagavaso Tabagata, Vadra Me Muncha, Vadri Bhava, Mamahatsa Miyatsapa, Ah Hum Pat. So becoming aware of the body. Really allowing the body to settle upon its meditation spot. 
And having the sense of the mind dropping into the heart. So mind, heart becomes one. Yes. When we move into greed, hatred and delusion, the mind has pushed the heart out. Mind, heart is one. So really have the sense of the mind dropping into the heart and mind, heart settling into the guts. And really see if you can see yourself in your mind's eye. Really see if you can look at the self with warm, kind, loving eyes. And just notice the experience in the body. And saying to the self, with deeds of loving kindness, I purify my body. With deeds of loving kindness, I purify my mind, body, and speech. Just really see if you can feel the vibration of the phrase as you say it to yourself. And you can say it out aloud. With deeds of loving kindness, I purify my body. With deeds of loving kindness, I purify my mind, body, and speech. And the mind will wander. It's just what the mind loves to do. And that's okay. We just gently rope it back in, bring the mind back in. And really see if you can just allow these few minutes to just be with the self. And saying to the self, with open-handed generosity, I pay attention to the self. With open-handed generosity, I take good care of the self. And just notice the vibration in the body as you really kind of bring into mind of just treating the body, the self with open-handed generosity. The mind will wander. It's what the mind loves to do. And so just smilingly and gently bring it back. Bring it back. 
to the body, mind, heart, meditation spot. And saying to the self, in letting go of all the stories, all the stories, in letting go of all the stories, I cultivate stillness, simplicity and contentment within the self. Letting go of all the stories about other, letting go of all the stories about the self. I cultivate stillness, simplicity, and contentment within. And remember to breathe. And becoming aware of the in-breath, the out-breath. And again, becoming aware of the vibration of in letting go of all the stories of the self and of other, I cultivate stillness, simplicity and contentment within. Okay, really have a sense of the self, really see if you can see the self in your mind's eye. And perhaps even if you can't see yourself placing a hand upon the heart and the belly, just letting the self know that you are there for it. And just giving the body the warmth of your own hand. And saying to the self, with truthful communication, I cultivate truthful communication within and without cultivating truthful communication within. Yes, letting go of all that self-talk, all that stinking thinking, which isn't true. So cultivating truthful communication within and also cultivating truthful communication without, outside, outside of us when we verbally speak into the world. Yes, cultivating truthful communication within the heart mind. And the mind will wander, gently bringing it back. And just become aware of any chatter in the head and just letting it know this is not me, this is not mine, this is not I. Letting the chatter go without identifying with that speech, that nonsense, that record player. The 
it's really possible to to dwell in the emptiness of the mind, the stillness of the mind. Yes, as we think of the self and cultivating loving kindness towards the self, just having the, the wish for mindfulness clear and radiant. I purify my mind, having the commitment to cultivate mindfulness, clear and radiant, to help purify the mind, body and speech. Now inviting you to, to sit with the strong wish to be at peace. Yeah. Really invite yourself to just have the strong wish to be at peace and really see if you can experience that wish to be at peace on a visceral level. And if you're not sure what's peace like, you have no idea what it is that you're wishing for. Well, the definition of peace can be just free from all that papancha, free from that mental proliferation, free from all those stories running around your head, free from the thoughts, the stinking thinking, free. That is peace. So just allowing yourself to sit with the strong wish to be at peace without struggling with reality. And in this moment, you can be in peace if you allow yourself to be here right now on your meditation spot. You can be here in peace. So let go of past, future, and be here in the now so that you can have a taste of freedom, a taste of being at peace. The mind will wander. That's what the mind loves to do. And the practice is simply noticing it wanders and simply bringing it back again. So bringing it back to the strong wish of being at peace. And just feeling the body being supported by your meditation spot. Okay. Maybe some of you might like to put in the chat uh, what came up for you, how that was for you. And then, uh, yeah, it'd be quite nice to, um, some of you are up for writing in the chat. Yeah. Anyone going to 
share in the chat. Yeah, uh, my wishes to self had to be shared with, with all. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, dedicating the, the, the practice is, is interesting because um, that, that makes me think of the fourth, the fourth site in a way. How do we, how do we share? And in a way, I, I think of the, Again, we go back to the to the prince and what made the the prince go forth, and it wasn't the awareness of he's going to die or he's going to age and you know he's going to get sick. It was actually seeing a mendicant walking along the streets with a begging bowl, radiating peace, and so that's how. We really share it with with the world. It, it's it's almost like um, that bodhisattva vow. We have the bodhisattva vow of helping all beings, but who are we really helping? When we help ourselves, we help the others. And you know, it, if we if we can be at peace, that will impact everybody around us. If we can cultivate peace, that's uh, and we know that there are we can come into contact with people and we can we can feel this the the peace and we can feel the stillness and it has it's that in a way that's how we share our practice if we practice we are sharing practice if we don't practice then we're not sharing practice yeah mm. thank you all of you for um sharing in the chat and i know sometimes when we come out of the sit it's it's just not the thing that we want to be doing. We don't want to be talking. We don't want to be sharing on the screen. So thank you. So today it was framed a compassionate conversation about race. So if it's going to be a conversation, that means I don't do all the talking. Yeah, if it's if it's a conversation. Yeah. Otherwise, we would have called it. We would have called it something else. OK, so um, just to let you um know how I work a, a little bit about myself. Um, I, some of you might be familiar with Dr. Gabor Mate's work. Um, I'm, a, I'm one of the founding facilitators of his work, uh, a group of us under the leadership of uh, Sat Duran put together his work into a course called Compassionate Inquiry. So I teach people compassionate inquiry and I work as a practitioner counselor in the form of compassionate inquiry. And I'm trained as a internal family systems therapist. So an, an inquiry is something that's been with me through my work of mindfulness and conflict transformation. And so that conversation that we have is, is, is an inquiry is, is, is an inquiry, inquiring into people's experiences. So um, what is it? What, 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 what would you like to explore uh, around this topic of race? What, what's, what's some of the things that you might struggle with? Um, and if you do, I will actually ask for the recording to 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 stop and, and pause so that uh, that dialogue isn't actually recorded. OK, this is, is so this is just for us here. So what is it? What what you know, is, is there anything that you've ever really wanted to ask a person of color and not had the courage? to ask let's let's work with that so it's a invitation and and some of you might be experiencing discomfort that's fantastic because that's the work you know 
the dharma is all about working with the discomfort it was never like this is going to be comfortable and this is going to be easy again when i go to um if we we look at the prince's trajectory of becoming woke often people teach that the the prince vowed to find enlightenment the prince never vowed to find enlightenment the prince actually said something like i will not move from this spot until i find an end of suffering very different see the bypassing if we if we vow to find enlightenment we're definitely going to spiritually bypass yeah but if we vow to find an end of suffering and vow to find the end of suffering of racism we have to face the suffering and that's what the prince did in vowing to find an end of suffering came face to face with the suffering and all that suffering it's there in in the head in the mind it's, you know it's it's mind made this 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 suffering you know it's it's a, there is the pain and there's the second art and my practice is how can i take that second art out you know every time i hear the news that another black or brown body's been killed my practice is how can i take that second art out because there is pain okay this pain is unavoidable and that was what was taught pain is unavoidable yeah.